<laughs> I think that's a wonderful place for us to start. I think if we could all dedicate those seven minutes every day to that, I think the world would be a very different place. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Um, I'm conscious we have a lot of questions from our audience, which is fantastic. So I'll, I'll get started straight away. Uh, Frank Rumpf uh, begins and he asks uh, whether, well, he says he started meditating recently. He wonders if Mathieu recommends going to the Himalayas to experience the real thing. Well, if you want as a way of life, first of all, wherever there is a, a conducive place and a authentic or experienced person that can lead you a little further than when you are now on your life and on the path, then Himalayas uh, you know, doesn't have to be exotic. Uh, of course, the main thing, whether it's in the West, whether it's in the East, North, South, is that if you look for an instructor, and I think you always need instructor, whatever you do, whether it's gym, uh, sailing, music, please be very careful <laughs> not to fall on the quack, on the charlatan, someone who is genuine, who is kind, who is sincere, who has more quality than you have. Otherwise, it's like, you know, taking baths, wishing to wash yourself and you end up with more mud. Mm -hmm. So look for the right instructor, man or woman. And then, yes, it can be anywhere in the world, but it has to be authentic. So before committing yourself, just be careful. And there is, there is a follow-up question from Frank, which is about retreats. He says he's a little afraid of, of such a thing particularly the idea of being quiet for many days in a row? Well, I mean, those things come step by step, you know, like meditation. I mean, in the Buddhist Tibetan tradition, you don't learn meditation for many years. First, you reflect on how valuable is human life, impermanence. You know, you train in, in compassion, in all these things. But so it depends if you go to a place where you teach basic meditation a few times a week, Oh, it's a whole path. There's a comp you know, it's like the distance from the earth and the sky. There's so many ways. And there's no reason that we should do retreat soon, anytime. You know, we do retreat when it's time to come and you really have some teachings to put into practice. You know what you do. You got all the explanation. You clarify anything you need. So there's no need to jump into anything that comes your way. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a question from Charlotte Frischer who asks, uh, I think this one would be best for, for Stephen as well. She says, my father had a severe stroke and has asphagia. If he started to meditate, could that support a stronger recovery if he starts now? Thanks. If I can just come back to the first question of Frank, I think uh, going to the Himalayas for the real thing, maybe we should see meditation really as something universal. It's not only Buddhist, uh, I think every religion, also in Eastern Germany, there, there's Christian um, contemplative tradition uh, offered also in, in German uh, uh, monasteries. And, and, and so definitely we should not see this only through the prism of, of Buddhism, uh, as far as, as I'm concerned. And for aphasia, uh, so that's people having a stroke and then difficulty talking. Uh, well, of course, you need a good a hospital neurologist and, and, and uh, I would say the, the, the neurological care there. Uh, but yes, indeed, there are studies that, that show the added value of, of meditation. And um, as those who suffer from, you know, finding their words know, uh, it, it can increase stress and make things worse. And even just that um, fact can, can uh, be dealt with. Uh, but that's what we, we just said. Meditation can stand for a number of exercises. Uh, don't see it as a magic bullet, uh, but yes, it can be complementary. And there's very interesting trials going on. Mm. Uh, we have another question here, uh, an anonymous attendee who asks, how do you know what kind of meditation is right for you and your needs? Who should we ask that to? Stephen, let's start with you on that one. Oh, I don't know if I should uh, take a go here, but, but really it's important to, to, to sit down and ask yourself the question, well, what are my needs and why, why am I doing this? Which is uh, the question Mathieu was asking when we started to meditate, it, it, it's, it's important. Uh, and then of course we can separate the, 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 the clearly medical indications and, and there you need a lot of research, indications, counterindications, side effects. And, and there 
um, specific added values. And, and uh, I would like to see more research there because when I go to conferences uh, in medicine, it's still a lot, if not all, about pharmaceutical industry and, and you know, the, uh, the, the drugs, which, which is maybe not the whole story. Uh, and then there's just the rest and, and, and depending on uh, what, what your need is, uh, where I would never say, you know, it should be this and only this way. Um, I, I think that there's different paths. And, and if someone says, you know, if you're not meditating my way, it's bad. It would be like some, some teacher uh, who is if talking about sports and it, it should only be uh, my, I don't know, play badminton and all the rest is bad for you. No, of course, that doesn't make sense. Uh, so so uh, very important and for you to define mm -hmm. what do you want to achieve here? Mathieu, do you want to add to well, that? Well, you know, it also depends, you know, meditation are also different kinds of mind trainings are different antidotes for different causes of suffering. So do you suffer more because of bouts of anger? Or is it anxiety or jealousy or obsession or lust, whatever? So this is completely different. So when you go to see a doctor and before telling your symptoms, they say, what medicine is best? What do you have? A headache or stomach problem? So, and uh, you know, uh, I, I need a key for opening my door. Give me a very good key. No, you need a key that opens your door. So, likewise, if anger is your problem, so there, you know, meditation on patience, meditation on loving kindness, if it's animosity. So, every, every type of mental affliction has a different antidotes and that's part of mind training to find the right antidotes to the right uh you know affliction that's very very good advice now we have a uh, joy marchese asks what recommendations do you have for meditating with young children i have a four-year-old and i would like her to begin to enjoy mindfulness practice and have it become part of her daily life uh, who would like to go on that first oh, Matthew? I can, oh no I God, yeah. that one you know five kids so talking from experience here uh, really do what you can, right? It, it, it's definitely putting the bar too high to say, okay, well now I have my program, you are going to meditate and it's going to be five minutes. And it's not happening. And, and my wife, you know, Mathieu Vanessa, uh, who is, is doing mindfulness with, with children and, you know, she, she would come with, with a lot of ideas and then, you know, they just go uh, and, and you need to adapt. And if it's 30 seconds, sometimes it's already a victory. So you need to adapt, you need to um, be creative and you can also use the movement there um, and it's uh, definitely possible um, but, but don't put your expectations uh, too high. I see all of my kids actually do meditate. Um, the oldest is 22 at university uh, and you know they find things on the internet. Uh, the, 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 the youngest uh, I mentioned, Louis, uh, I posted a video in, in the middle of lockdown where he's doing this focused attention on the breathing is definitely not always like that, but, but it, 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 is, it is wonderful to do it together. And um, actually, I, I can give it away. We're, we're working on a book. So my wife and I, um, Meditation for Kids uh, with Drownings by my, by my brother, who's an artist. So uh, yes, do well, it. You know, like uh, Richard Davidson and his team at the Center for Healthy Minds, they did a so-called kindness curriculum that's 10 weeks, 40 minutes, four, four times a week. The kids love it. And it's not just kindness, it's attention on the bread and all kinds of things, emotional balance. And the kids love it. And uh, it has very good effect even on cognitive uh, faculty, on pro-social behavior. It's completely secular. So if you take it skillfully, you know, if you say I bring meditation in the school, you know, many parents say, well, what's that? You know, some exotic sort of religious stuff. If you say, look, there's a way to improve attention, emotional balance and pro-social behavior. And we say, wow, how do you do that? So basically, it's, you know, it's cultivating skills and uh, with the mind. So that's, uh, that's what it is. And, and these skills are more and more 
uh, in need in a world where children are used to being on screens with their attention pulled a million different ways in, in such a short space of time. So definitely something for, for many parents. In fact, we've already had Charlotte Frisch, uh, Frischer replying saying, thank you so much for that. She's going to try and find books on, on this with children. Um, we have another question here from David Harris, uh, who talks about this, this idea of meditation as a pill, you know, replacement for certain medicines that we, we touched on during our, our conversation. He says, Mathieu, you've not said anything about the spiritual aspects of meditation. For you, is meditation more than an alternative to a pill? So it's not the spiritual aspect of meditation, is that meditation is just one element of a very, very vast, profound, and long spiritual path that takes the whole life. So meditation is just one of the tools of training your mind. It's a whole worldview. It's a whole way of living, leading your life from A to Z. So then, of course, if it's at your goal, the goal of meditation is not to uh, basically, if you practice mindfulness, it doesn't have the worldview of you know, the philosophical view on the, the, the union of emptiness and appearance, all this philosophical view that also nourish a practitioner. He doesn't have the motivation. May I transform myself so that I can benefit all sentient beings, a sort of a altruistic wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of beings. None of this is there. So then it becomes a whole path. And that's quite different. Now, still, you know, there are some tools, if they work and if they are valid for every human being who has a mind, which is the cow case, then they are not specifically Buddhist, the tools themselves. You know, if a, if a uh, Japanese physicist find a new uh, basic particle, it's not, it doesn't become Japanese, either it's there or it's not there. So if some of the tools like attention, emotional balance, again, loving kindness, basic mind trainings are useful to anyone, that's it, they are useful. Whether you are Buddhist, agnostic, Christian, nothing at all. So now, but they are not embedded in the whole context of a path, of a lifelong path, but nevertheless, they are useful. So it's not diminishing, sort of making a Buddhist light, sort of new sort of thing. It's just extracting some methods some in the toolbox that are useful to every single human beings. But that's not at all makes a whole path. Nevertheless, it can be very useful. And a good example is mindfulness that came out of Buddhism. Uh, John kabat himself is not a Buddhist. He says that. But it has been incredibly powerful and useful in hospital and in many other places to help people who suffer. So that's it. This doesn't pretend to be a, you know, a minimized form of Buddhism. It's a tool that is useful for every certain being who has a mind, and we do have a mind. Uh, we have another anonymous attendee who's asking, what about the recent research with somewhat critical stance towards meditation, especially the studies showing that it can aggravate certain anxieties or traumas? Should beginners uh, of meditation be wary of any possible risk? Let's, let's ask that to Stephen first. So it's a, it's a very good point, right? I, I think it's important to uh, not just study and, 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 and publish on positive effects, but uh, clearly define what are the contraindications when you should not do it, what are the possible side effects just as with drugs. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, this, this really requires a healthcare professional. So if you suffer from anxiety, please go and talk uh, about this with, with your uh, a healthcare practitioner and, and he will take care of it or, or refer you to a psychologist, psychiatrist and so on and so forth. And then it's just one of the tools um, that I do believe uh, have added value. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's important that we remain very critical. Uh, and in the book, I also give uh, you know, an overview of, of what are uh, the current studies and even psychosis, where for a long time we thought, well, it's impossible to, to talk about meditation, mindfulness, when you have this, this psychotic, uh, psychiatric disturbances. But even there, you know, it, it, it can be um, touched upon. And, and so uh, that's really important to discuss it with, with your healthcare professional. But I think there's, a, you know, we should never have an agenda when we do research or 
neither to prove meditation because we want to prove it, nor to have an agenda against meditation and say meditation is bad. Any tool can be very bad in the wrong place at the wrong time for the wrong person in the wrong circumstances. If you are highly disturbed, then maybe if you try to sit and quiet your mind, it will aggravate your symptoms. So it's nothing to do with the meditation itself being wrong. It's the wrong tool at the wrong time for the wrong person. So that's it, you know. It's like medicine. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, a powerful antibiotic is, is bad if it's, if it's not suited for, if someone has an allergic reaction or something, it's just being given to the wrong patient at the wrong time. And so when people do retreats, especially, the teachers should uh, be very careful not to bring people who are already about to blow the fuse. And of course, definitely they'll blow the fuse if you put them in this 10 day silence, they will become completely out of, the, <laughs> out of their minds. So, so that's what your treating psychologist would do, right? He would listen to you when you would um, discuss together what is the tool we could use here and, 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 and then switch from one to the other. So it's just one of the tools. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm conscious we've gone extraordinarily over our time. In fact, this is the longest I've ever gone over, over on a session. So I apologize, but at the same time, I hope, I mean, I can see our audience is still with us. Uh, uh, thank you for, for staying with us. And to you, Stephen, and to Mathieu for giving us these extra precious uh, 18 minutes of your, of your time now. It's really, really <laughs> kind. We appreciate it. Um, it's been a, a fascinating and fantastic discussion. The, the exercises, we've gone from the, the theoretical to the practical, which is amazing. I hope that everyone at home watching uh, has an idea of what meditation uh, can do and how for all of us it could help us to connect uh, to ourselves and to those around us in a more productive, more happy, more, uh, I guess, a calm way, uh, which in an increasingly uh, fragmented world, I think is, is the, the, the best thing we can ask for. Um, I'd like to end with a thought that's in, that's in the book. Um, it comes uh, from Sharon Salzberg, the co-founder of the Insights Meditation Society. She says mindfulness, I would add to the word meditation, is not difficult. We just need to remember to do it. So I hope all of us can just remember to do it, even for a small amount of time. Thank you very much, Stephen and Matthew. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bella. Cheers.